continue. This meeting is being recorded. Um, yes. So my question today is: How does the Ukrainian oligarchy keep going as a political and economic institution? And I'm going to give my answer up front because, as the instructor said in our first UPhD class, this isn't isn't a who done it. So. And my answer is that it keeps going through its habitual political and economic practices. I'll go through in more detail as we go along what that means, but that's my essential answer. Um, before I do that, this is what I'm going to say today. So I want to mainly talk about what my results are, what the results of the research I've done so far are. Um, but there's some necessary um, preliminaries that must be gone through, I think, to, to put it into context. So um, this, this is the other one. My third, my, my three topics are the wealth of the Ukrainian rich, the voting patterns in the Rada, seen as, um, you know, a product of, of bribery, essentially. And then my third one is energy sector schemes, which is the one I'm working on at the moment, but I probably won't get to that because I think I've already packed in too much, so we'd be concentrating on the first two, the wealth and, and the um, oligarch influence in the Rada. So these are my, um, these are my uh, essential um, introdu introductory points. When I, quite early on in my, um, in my studies, I put together a, a theory of two theories. One was a theory Oligarchy as um, sociology, with another uh, as a general theory of prosperity from Why Nations Fail, and I, I joined them because the essential point of of the Why Nations Fail book is that um, bad political rules lead to bad economic rules, and that's what I've fitted my research into, and that leads to my thesis, which is that. The two sort of elements of my um, motivating how the oligarchy reproduces itself and Ukraine's poor economic performance over decades are two sides of the same coin. For the sake of um, completeness, I've put in the theoretical side, but I, I want to skip over that. I don't want to say um, too much on that. I want to say the conclusions that I've come to on what Ukrainian oligarchy is and what's the difference between oligarchs and oligarchy. So, the two points about the definition of, of oligarchs that I've got there is the wealth is their characteristic resource power, as it says in the theory. The second point, which I got from Heiko Plains's paper, and I think is important, they're not just involved in politics anywhere. So I've got two definitions of because the oligarchy isn't in Ukraine isn't just the oligarchs, it's other political actors. The first definition I came across, which is a good one, and a, a structural definition of the oligarchy, is the second one, the second from the bottom, which is an institution where formal in politics, formal and informal in politics intertwine where very rich oligarchs and networks of successful business people intertwine to produce their um, political and economic practices. But the one that I've come to think is, is better, and the one that I've arranged my studies around, is the third one, which is oligarchy as a process. Um, in my third um, empirical chapter, I started for the first time, you know, quite an uh, old person, to read. This was the bit that was missing in my idea, because I was thinking, why does, how do these suboptimal processes keep going. And I thought to myself, that must be habit. And it turns out that in all the institutional economics, habit is the, the key concept. So this, so I arrive at my, um, this, the final definition, definition, which I've put in red, which is also one of my main conclusions that I'll repeat a couple of times, that the oligarchy is habitually re reproduced habitually reproduced by its extractive political, and I can't read it because, because everyone's pictures in my economic practice motivated and facilitated by wealth. So the extractive there is from the Why Nations Fail idea, which is extractive political institutions are essentially exclusionary and extractive economic ones are essentially self-serving. So that's what I've got here. This 
lead on to where my four pieces of research, including my literature review, which I count as one of the pieces of research, fit into the overall pattern of what the Ukrainian processes that help to reproduce the Ukrainian oligarchy. These are in blue. So that's points one, two, three, and four. And those, that's what I'm doing. And I'm calling that the national circuit of reproduction of the oligarchy. So the original accumulation schemes and the inheritance of the Soviet, late Soviet um, society plus late Soviet reforms leads to the um, development of the original oligarchs in the, um, in the 1990s. But once they've uh, got their wealth, um, then it sets in a process of them trying to maintain and augment it. So my first study, which I'm, I'm going to go on today, is um, essentially how, how rich are the uh, Ukrainian oligarchs after the Maidan? And does that translate into a reduction in political influence? The answer is no, probably not, because the material that's observable to us isn't, isn't their whole wealth. Um, this leads on to the first goes around in the circuit to the, the second of my empirical topic chapters, which is um, essentially painful votes in the RAD. But I didn't want to look at um, wondering whether um, that was connected with olig uh, oligarchs um, limiting the passes or, or objecting to or preventing the passage of uh, laws related to what I'm calling institutional prosperity theory. So that took a while of choosing the laws, the, the sort of laws that are related to that, and then checking the voting patterns in the post-Maidan period. My third one is on the, my third empirical chapter, which is point four on here, is on um, energy sector um, rent extraction schemes, which is, the there are many rent extraction schemes across the uh, Ukrainian oligarchy. Rents are where you, the, the simplest way of, of, of saying what a rent is, is it's um, a product getting something for nothing or getting wealth out of a situation without contributing um, to wealth creation. And, and, and that's one of the most uh, characteristic features of the Ukrainian oligarchy. And the essential one have been in the in the energy sector since since the 90s. And the, the most essential one of that has been in the gas sector until 2014, where um, the read of gas imports from Russia put a stop to that, and the oligarchs had to move their, their rent extraction schemes to other sectors. So um, I want to say what I've missed out in this sector. Uh, I want to say that the, the points that I've included here, I want to put my national level uh, analysis into Point five, which is the regional piece, and this is an important part of the oligarchy. People will control an area in, in Ukraine and they will offer to political support in that region in return for um, representation at the national level, national resources essentially. So that's one of the feeders. And the two, two other important ones are the two sides of the international financial sector and the legal sector, because that's where the oligarchs hide their money when they're out of favour, or even when they're not out of favour. And that's an important valve that, that, that keeps the, the system going, as does the international financial institutions restabilization of the economy once it goes into its periodic meltdowns. Another two other international connections are the Russian connection, which is has been extremely important until 2014 because the Russian elite and the Ukrainian elite essentially share the rents from the gas trade between them. And that's that's been um, an important source of it. So as I move on, I want to say that the ones that I'm- the... Hey Dave, may I interrupt for a second? Yes. Um, uh, first of all, we're about, uh, about nine minutes in now, just uh, for you to know. And also there, some, there are some connectivity issues. I think it might be something related to your Wi-Fi. So maybe, uh, maybe if you switch your camera off while you show the slides, um, um, that might improve things a bit. How do I do that? What, did you just... Oh, wait, okay, is that bad? Okay. Yeah. Ah, yes, okay. Okay, yeah, I see it, yeah. Fine, I'll do that. Um, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go into my um, wealth as a resource power. So this is what I've done. I've collected a database and my research question is on the down at the bottom. Has their wealth de declined? The answer is 
yes and no. For the for the people I collected from the Focus database, it's has declined, but within a small group within that, the, the relative power of their wealth to Ukrainian society has increased. This is one of the things I collected. So I collected database from Ukrainian database Focus 100, and then I calculated um, Ukraine's national wealth. And one of the interesting you can see is like a Piketty style wealth income ratio, which shows that before the war, despite the difference in their sizes, the, U the Ukrainian economy and the Russian economy had similar wealth income ratios, which is of 400 to 450%, which means that um, it's a sort of measure of productivity of how much, how many years of um, output uh, divide into the national wealth. This, this graph down the bottom, the one with the, the red line on it, this is probably the most important one on wealth. This sh the red line shows the share of national wealth or business wealth of the Focus 100 as, as a share of national wealth over time with the background blue is the, the, the dollar numbers on with the, the calculation, the, the, the ledger on the left. And this is the, the, the red ledger on the right. So you can see that what's from the peak in 2010, when it's about 18% of, of national wealth, it falls um, to below 10% by 2017. And, and one of the interesting things about this is that it, most, it falls most sharply under Yanukovych rather than Poroshenko. The, the, the sharpest period is that. So the question here, and this is the answer in, answer in my, my research question, is does that mean translate as reduced power of the elite? No, not at all, because the elite have a lot of stocks filled abroad. And you can see this in hidden abroad, which you can see in the capital outf outflows, which I haven't included. The other point I want to make about this is the wealth of the very rich is just a potential power that needs to be mixed with other resource power, either the mobilization power of successful politicians and the, the stakeholders' power. So that's that's the answer is no, it doesn't necessarily reduce their power. This one is interesting because it, it shows the rich last longer on the rich list, which is kind of ties in with the, my, my theory of or the theory that I've been using of wealth defense. Um, and you can see that it's got a, a very small uh, correlation coefficient, but it's that's um, knackered a bit by the outliers, which is Akhmetov and, and uh, Mittal, who was included once in the, first, in the first focus rich list. So what you can do on, on status is you can you can, this, this is what I'm calling the core rich, the people who, who appear in the first, of the, the top quarter of the list, and they last for more than a quarter of the time, more than on the rich list. And some of these are familiar names, and you can see um, what I've got here is that these are the most successful pe people, and even the rich list, the wealth is skewed towards the top end. Many of these people are on my definition, oligarchs. They are rich people who are involved in politics and you can see they listed their political involvement along the side. What's also interesting, which my next slide shows, is um, you can pick out sectors that the oligarchs are, are associated with. They're basically associated with metallurgy, energy, um, media, medium and um, banking. Down the bottom, you've got a much better description of how powerful these are in relation to society. It's their average wealth on the rich list compared to society. So you can see um, Akhmetov owns, on average, his business wealth, observable business wealth is worth 2% of Ukrainian um, total wealth. This is this was a, uh, um, one of my inferential statistics what I was going to do, com uh, comparison mean. What, what it shows is, is that those who lose wealth over 2013 to 2017 is, is associated with the sector, but controlling for uh, political involvement, that slightly changes for industry oligarchs. Anyway, RADA, what am I doing on the RADA? I also collected um, another database of voting on these um, 
prosperity laws, which are, you can see listed on the far right of the table. They're things to do with um, businesses having freedom to operate, and they're also to do with in, implementation of um, property laws and to do with um, pluralistic politics. I chose the rider because I think one of the things that's happened in since the Maidan is, even though it's been one of the periods of the most reform that's happened in Ukrainian independence history, what the elite did, they kept the essential institutions of the oligarchy and the Rada is one of those. It's a place where the elite meet for um, alliances and deal making and where the oligarchy, one of the places where the oligarchy is realized. And the, the, my research question is, can you see that? Can you, can you see that the, they're using their wealth to vote against laws associated with prosperity? My answer is, um, there is a systematic pattern of the oligarchs who are associated with the, the members of parliament who are associated with the old oligarchs um, voting against prosperity laws. And, and um, the second point is that there's a break in voting. Um, Breaking voting patterns under Croydon when my, my, my sound is going weird. Sorry, there's no sense. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's a break in voting patterns under Grisman when yeah. um, when the, the five party post Maidan coalition breaks up and, and the government needs to rely on oligarchic votes. So, quickly, this is my study of um, old oligarchic voting against uh, prosperity laws. And you can see it's just a cross table. The first table is that this I picked out 74 MPs who book belong to one of the six old oligarchic groups. And you can see Colin Whiskey's people at the top and then Archimedes got that couldn't fit them all on. And you can see in this, from this cross table on the right, the strong polarization of those um, old oligarchs voting not for, or not turning up to vote for prosperity laws. So this is this, the statistical test, the Akai square test. And the results of this are a high-ish a uh, chi-square statistic um, with a p-value below. I'm not going to go to the technicalities of that, but basically it shows statistically a significant relation and a, a modestly strong relation for 14 out of the um, 17 laws that I looked at. This is the break between the second and third, my, what I'm calling my second and third periods, where um, the formal parties, um, the old Maidan or five party coalition parties, their, their votes in this, in, in the, under the first hit Senate government in blue are in the top uh, chart and their votes are in grey the, under the Groisman government. You can see their four and the parties that come from the party of regions, they rise. And then these are the old oligarchic groups and they're, they're, the share of their people backing government laws uh, rises um, between the second and third periods as well for the reasons that I've said. One of the things that you can find out, the, it's a sort of a side effect that you can find out, is um, things that you weren't looking for necessarily. And one of this is, is gives you con continuity between elites. What you can see here is parties in the seventh convocation, the last part of the, uh, the Yanukovych parliament, um, what their MPs became. And you can see that, the, the for example, that the most of the POR members who got through to the the, the, the parliament from tw late 2014 went to the opposition bloc. You can see that most of the Udar people um, from Klitschko went to um, um, the Petro Poroshenko bloc, the party of the um, party of the president. So what this is interestingly shows is um, recycling of the state elites. I thought. Right, I'm going to sum up now. Um, three points to um, three three broad conclusions. Well, first one, first one is the one that I've already said because that's a, I think a very important uh, insight, which is that the Ukrainian oligarchy uh, can be seen as a habitual political it's set of poli habitual political and economic processes interconnecting at the regional, national, and international levels. Wealth is only a potential source of power that must be mixed with other resource powers um, and other networks, not just the oligarchs' networks. 
Um, a third point is that all the things that you, I've seen through this, the, the, the change in the constitutional electoral rules, the loose factions and the weak parties, the unimplemented energy and rules and regulations, the, the flexibility of these things are not um, accidents. They are a characteristic of the oligarchy. They're working properly. They, they correspond to its the type of political economy it is. As, as I would say in Marxism, it's a super structural phenomenon corresponding to real ownership relations. The wider relevance of this is, I think the cyclical uh, view of the reproduction of the elite is more realistic when you're looking at such issues as democracy building, state building or market building, because if you think, for example, that the Ukrainian elite is a national Ukrainian phenomenon rather than an international and a regional one, then the way you address it won't work, the way you address it to mitigate it or to overcome it. Third one, is, which I've noticed, the last one that I've noticed in doing my studies is that the, um, the tactics or practices of the Ukrainian elite alert you to what goes on more surreptitiously in, in the West um, because they're in the open. And I think that's one of the applications of it that would be really interesting. And that's all I want to say for now. Sorry about speeding through the last bit. Hey, thank you very much, Dave. It's great and bang on time, 20 minutes. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'd ask you to either post them in the chat or raise your hand or simply write in the chat that you would like to ask something and then I can ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Um, to start with though, uh, I would like to use uh, my, my privilege as the organizer of the seminar series to ask uh, a couple of questions to, to Dave. Um, first one, could you briefly explain, uh, explain or expand a bit more on what how you define prosperity laws because as far as i understand you see that somehow as, as a measure of uh, voting against prosperity laws as a way to block or to, to retain wealth and to block block progress so i'm quite would be quite interested in how you exactly you define these kinds of laws and secondly since the, the sound was a bit bad in the beginning right. maybe would you be able to go back uh, to the, the the diagram you showed at the very beginning and maybe walk us briefly walk us through it again maybe in the light of what you said afterwards um okay i will do that and then just put your findings into the context of that of the diagram. Sure. and maybe um, um i mean you might want to turn your your camera off again just to, to okay. make the sound uh, sure i will do am i off yeah um the the the, the why nations file book has a certain list that is quite hard to find of of um economic rules that it thinks should be in place. These are basically protection of property and openness uh, of markets to ensure competition. So what I did, because that's quite narrow, I opened it up to two other sort of ideas which are using the law. Um, and these are um, business operations type of, type of uh, approaches, which um, look at similar types of ideas and then the uh, Schumpeterian ideas of innovation because they have a similar and this is a bit looser. So if I can go to, um, do, do I list on my, uh, let me have a look, do I list on my laws? Yes, so the sorts of laws that they are, are their investment protection laws, for example, which would come under a business environment law, their laws on joint stock firms, laws on um, state ownership of and state intervention. There's specific ones that I looked at to do with sectoral ones that the, the, the oligarchs are associated with, such as gas um, and uh, the financial sector, but there are also political ones, such as party finances um, and the prevention of, of uh, corruption in public life. So that it's, it's what the Why Nations Fail book is a sort of general theory of why some nations are rich and some nations are poor. And what I did, I, I didn't, I mean, although I'm somewhat critical of it, I didn't um, bring that to the fore. I just worked inside that and said, if these laws were correct, is this one of the explanations why um, the blocking of the elite might explain 
a, a political economy explanation, a systemic explanation of Ukraine's um, poor economic performance over many years, which is one of the key um, key questions of my research, which I can, if I can show you here. Um, But here you can see Ukraine's terrible economic performance over many years, not just on GDP, where 2017 it was um, still 20% low, it's 1991 uh, level, which is which I won't go into. But you look at it in more widely, you can look at uh, its FDI performance. If you can see on the chart 1.2 below, its FDI is poor both in absolute terms and per head. It's very, very poor in comparison with other countries. Same with the Human Development Index, which is a sort of wider measure of, of economic progress, which incorporates health and, and education as well as um, GDP per head. Ukraine's performance has increased the least of any, within the region, within the world average, and then compared with the spectacular performance of China. So that's, that's really the reason for my looking at that. So go, to go back to this, chart this is what i was trying to do here was situate it's to, to fend off um criticisms of um what do they call it methodological nationalism i'm just concentrating on the national level of how the wealth leads is transformed into political influence how political influence is transformed into wealth and that re restocks it and goes goes around in a cycle i wanted to put in other elements that also help I'm not looking at specifically, although they impinge on my studies, uh, that that um, that affect the reproduction of, of the um, oligarchy as, as a system of practices. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Now we have a question from Ryan McHenry, and maybe you would, if you would like to ask it yourself, I'll ask you to unmute. Otherwise, I can I can read it out for you yeah sure so i just wrote three different questions um you can answer one or all of them one is just wondering um if you find that the oligarchs are having to shift their pr strategies um so are they having to mask some of their efforts more as philanthropy or entrepreneurship um and do you think the average ukrainian is more aware about these oligarchs and how they operate as opposed to you know earlier in the 2000s? Um, and do you think there are any successes and failures in terms of managing the oligarchs under Zelensky's tenure? Um, thank you for those. Um, the first one, I can say, you know, the, the PR is most obvious with Akhmetov. That's, that's the clearest one. I mean, he's on his TV channel, he's constantly promoting his his fund for refugees, which, by the way, my mother-in-law got out of the Donbass on, so I'm, I'm not knocking him for it. But the other one that he promotes, um, he promotes himself on, is through his, through his football team. So, um, but essentially, one of the other channels that I didn't look at, I mean, because there's, there are several of them that are important. One is the funding elections, one is through buying votes, another one is through the media. All the oligarchs' um, media channels are self-promotion and, you know, PR channels to some degree. Um, the punishment and reward in Hendel. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, very, you, the, the Henry Howe stuff comes more into, into play in my uh, energy sector um, chapter, which I haven't gone into, because what I'm looking at there is how energy scams of the elite change as the policy environment changes does with the energy after 2014, how changes in the changed political environment, the changed formal political environment, like Hale speaks about. Um, so with a, um, a more mixed system, the constitutional system that happens after they revert to the 2004 constitution. And, um, but also as uh, Sarah Whitmore says in her book, uh, Poroshenko is a strong leader who's able to eventually push there's a, a dual pyramid situation to begin with, with him and Yatsenyuk having their own 
networks, then he sort of sidelines that Senate. And that corresponds with the period of the changeover in Groisman, uh, with the Groisman government in mid-2016. Um, wider applicable model. I don't know about the wider applicability of it. I mean, you know, when I was thinking about this, basically the, my whole PhD is a case study of, of a specific oligarchy. And the, the 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 applicability applicability of it, I said at the end, I think that for quite a long time we've we've gone between, you know, um, setbacks to democracy, progress in democracy, backslide. And I th and I think as Hale says, that's that's not really accurate way of understanding the ideology of, of a lot of former Soviet countries. Can't remember what the third question was, sorry. Thank you. Maybe it, it, maybe it's worth moving on so we get a few more people to okay. ask their questions. Uh, Ryan, you can re-ask your third question in the end if, uh, if we come to a point where we don't have any more. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, Paul uh, Paul Fisher is um, next. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it yourself. Yeah, or... I wonder whether. Um, uh, sorry, I stepped out for a moment there, Dave. I I think you've actually answered my second question, um, which was wider applicability. Um, and you've also mentioned Hale. I don't know whether you actually started answering the questions that I posed, so apologies if I missed that. Um, but my, my two points were simply, firstly, actually, thank you very much for the presentation, absolutely fascinating. Um, but the first point was, where do you see it sitting within the wider literature about reward and punishment to coordinate elite networks? And there's obviously uh, relevance there, it seems, um, to um, the, the discussion around patronal politics. Uh, and the second point, which I think you've already just answered, is where do we see this uh, sitting within the wider region? You know, are, and are there are there distinctively Ukrainian phenomena that we're seeing here that distinguish it? And if so, if that's your view, what what would you highlight as being the, the key distinguishing features? Well, those are interesting questions. Yeah, I think my stuff is not incompatible with Hale's overall sociology. And I, in, in, the, in the RADA chapter, I go into detail on patronalism and his, his take, his modification of that. Um, I would say what a lot of these general theories are is an, an angle that can ask you on what's going on, and I wouldn't rule out any of them. And I think what mine does is it simply looks at where the money is, like it says in my chart where it says currency flows. I just simply look at the money, which is one dimension. I'm not looking at culture or media or anything like that. I'm just seeing where the cash goes. And, and, and that sort of sits within the, the overall model of, of, of Hale's model, which is, what I first thought about it was, well, second thought about it, I would say, I thought it was too abstract. It wasn't gritty enough to, 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 be, to be true. But now that I'm doing an ideal type model myself for the, my third chapter, I'm doing an ideal model of oligarch scams, um, I see that that's what he's doing. He's doing <laughs> a very variant ideal type modeling. I think when I went back and read it a couple of months ago, I think that he explicitly says that. So yeah, I think, it, I think that's a starting point. And, what I wanted to say about my schematic model is the same as I would say about his, is you mustn't mistake the model for the thing, because in practice, all these things are one. The politics and the economics and the international and the local, and the, they're, all, they're all of a piece. And we simply, simply analytically stand back from that to, to, to simplify it. Um, wider application. I wonder sometimes if the reason why the that the oligarchy is this fusion of economic and political fusion of the type it is in Ukraine is because of the state inheritance of the Soviet era. And clearly one of the things that the oligarchy goes back to is the Kozygin reforms of the 1960s, where they, they, they try to switch up to a market mechanism. The nomenklatura are forced to rely on underworld and you get the, the start of the political criminal nexus, which is one of the ingredients, which when the late Gorbachev reforms come in, fuses over time and eventually settles in the, in, in, the, in the form of the oligarchy. So I wonder if that's a specifically Ukrainian feature. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Dave. Um, next, uh, Rashid Chaudhuri would, would 
would you like to ask your question? Um, sure, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, David. And just to, uh, that, that was a very interesting presentation. And just to follow up on Ryan McHenry's question, uh, and also given, uh, David, you know, what, what you said about Ukrainian GDP in, in 2017 being lower than it was in uh, 1991. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, as far as I know, Ukraine is the, is the only country uh, in the former Soviet Union where that is the case. And of course, like when one travels to Ukraine, it is quite apparent even to the naked eye that, that you know, the, the economy hasn't progressed much since, since uh, the early 90s. Um, given that that is the case, um, what hope is there of any political players um, uh, who are attempting to shift power away from the oligarchs attaining any kind of success? Uh, and if there isn't much hope in that direction, why is it that there isn't more popular indignation regarding the stranglehold which the oligarchs seem to have over the Ukrainian political economy? Thanks. I would say this is another thing that I learned doing this, which is that oligarchy is the norm of human history and uh, liberal democracy is the, the aberrant condition. Um, so two, two points I, I would say about the, 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 the poor performance. One, that's quite controversial, the, um, those statistics, because a lot of economists obviously say that um, the statistics of the 1990s are very poor. I mean, uh, the transition recession, the scale of the transition recession. And two things which I think are true is the different incentive structures under the communist accounting system and then the capitalist one, which is the different incentives to under and over report. I think that's true. But when you look at their other arguments, um, oh, it's, you know, when they estimate, they re-estimate what the real fall was in the 90s. Those aren't very plausible because they, in some estimates, there is, they were about the same as in the 2008-9 crisis. And uh, if you look at life expectancy or other indicators like that, poverty, there's no, there's no booming uh, poverty or forward in life expectancy in 2008-9 like there is in the 90s. So I, th I think it was a, you know, a slump. So that, that's, the, that's the question. The, I think one of the, like, like I say at the end, one of the things that's gone wrong over the last, I, I was a, I did transition economics 25 years ago for my master's. And I remember thinking at the time, ah, they need to apply this sort of monetary policy to hold in inflation. And I remember thinking, but it's a different system. You know? and, and now, 25 years later, um, it's almost the, the politics, the, the, the long line of politics of, of state building or democracy building is still in that linear line, whereas Unless we understand that it's when once you've got rid of Yanukovych and his crew, you haven't got rid of the oligarchy. They're not the synonymous thing. The, the oligarchy is wider and a more resilient structure. Then you have no chance of, of addressing it or overcoming it. And although academics don't have to um, come up with solutions, when I was thinking about this, I, I thought about it and I thought, you know, the, Britain was an oligarchy in the 18th century. And America was an oligarchy in the 19th century. Maybe the, maybe the lessons for overcoming oligarchy are there. The negative side of that is maybe those are accidental. Maybe those overcame it through contingent reasons that are only specific to those times and places. But um, in Ukraine now, they seem on the rise. As they seem when Zelensky come to power, they seem to be winning. And as we all thought at the time, they've completely outmaneuvered Zelensky. As you would expect, they've been there for 25 years. They're experienced um, political operators. So it doesn't look great, I, I don't think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, Sahith Brahmanya with a question. Would you like to ask it yourself or would you like me to read it out? Yeah, yeah, I will ask the question. Uh, my voice audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, David, for the presentation. Uh, the question is, uh, there are some young democracies uh, which are uh, like maybe 60 or 70 years young. So they are they are having high hopes for uh, growth and economic prosperity, but they're heavily ridden by corruption and the 
corruption index, uh, global corruption index is very low for them. Mm -hmm. So these democracies uh, have opened their economies in around uh, some around in 70s and some around in 90s. But some sect of people, uh, the very rich, they tend to be the same. Uh, they continue to be rich even in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even in 2020. Whatever uh, the economic growth they continued, they're being continued to be rich. So the question is, uh, according to your research, did you find any groups, synonymous groups, uh, like oligarchs, characteristics, which uh, groups which have the same characteristics of oligarchs uh, in other parts of the world, uh, like in maybe South Asian countries uh, where we have young dem democracies like uh, Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan? As I, as I said before, I mean, and if, if you go back to if, if I put my, no, I can't put this slide up. If you go, you know, when you study, study oligarchy, one of the first people people always come back to, which surprised me, is um, Aristotle. And Aristotle doesn't say what people think he says, because he, he says the oligarchy is the self-interested rule of the few. But for him, the few and the rich are the same, because they're always going to be the, the, the same group. So what I said before is the oligarchy is the norm in historical time and current time all around the world, whether, whether it's the same as the Ukrainian oligarchy, I doubt. I, I suspect it achieves its ends through different means to sort of to take on the, the, the old institutional idea that studies have to look at specific mechanisms, specific uh, institutions, specific practices. I would imagine that we would find some similarities, but quite a lot of differences in the way they, they work in other parts of the world. Thank you, David. Thank you. Now, do we have any other questions at this point? You can just type in the chat that you have that you have a question, and then I'll. You don't need to type out the whole question in the chat. Then just ask you to unmute and ask it. Maybe in the meantime, shall we re return to uh, Ryan's third question, which right. uh, I correctly referred to? Yeah, the successes and failure during the Zelensky. Uh, during Zelensky's presidency in terms of the oligarchy. And uh, Dave, you just you already touched on that a bit, saying that the oligarchs uh, outmaneuvered uh, Zelensky. So maybe if you want to expand on that a little bit. Well, I, I looked at this recently because, um, you know, my, my study goes up to 2017. So, um, but I, I looked at this recently for another, for a conference. And, you know, immediately after, it was a conference on the Donbass, by the way, and the Donbass conflict. And immediately after the, um, his win in 2019, Zelensky is getting different oligarchs to promise to take care of different types of reconstruction of the Donbass. So, uh, you know, I say Akhmetov is in charge of medicine, uh, Kolomoisky is going to be do the roads, or, or he has some plan like that. But um, not appearing very to have moved very far since then, and I suspect not. And uh, just to just just to say, what one of the conclusions? I mean, will they want to go back to the Donbass? Donbass seems in a parlous condition, so I can't see why people like the oligarchs who are in, in, in reading, wearing two hats to say. In one hat, they are capitalists. In another hat, they're rent seekers. This is what we're saying about not mistaking the thing for the for the reality or the, the concept for the reality. But traditionally, you can't say that the Ukrainian oligarchs are known for their uh, investment. So um, why would they invest in somewhere where they can't realize, be certain of realizing a strong return? So I, I don't I don't see that. Um, successes and failures. Um, I, I I can't see any successes. One, one of the things that shocked me in this conference, which is related to this question, is I said, because I thought I was being really shocking, uh, the only way that the, the Minsk II um, could, could work is if um, pro-Russian forces pushed through the pro-Russian version of Minsk II, and everyone else something who'd be paying more attention to Ukraine over the last two years. So yeah, that's what we think will happen. So that, I think that's the answer to how he's doing with the oligarchs. I mean, we've seen the, the, the reconstitution of a lot of the people from the Poroshenko, from the Yanukovych period, a lot of the worst people, so not that well, I would say. And the other one is, of course, his backer, Kolomoisky, who famously defended the Southeast in the war, 
has now gone, now he's been prosecuted in America, he's gone back to, oh, it's a civil war, because he doesn't, <laughs> suggesting that he personally may want to do some sort of deal with the Russians, I think. So I, I realize you focus mostly on the on the RADA in, in your research. Yes. Have you, so on the periphery, maybe looked at a little bit at the Constitutional Court as well, because obviously that's a very... Um, when, when I started, I, I, I had, you know, much wider plans. <laughs> so every stage I've, or two, three stages, I've chopped it in half. One of the, one of, so for the, my political practices, I was going to look at the RADA and the judicial system, which is the other essential feature for keeping the oligarchy going. The procuracy and the judiciary, that's, the, those are obvious ones. I was going to look at not just the gas scheme as a, as a traditional rent sector scheme, but the military industrial complex, which was one of the ones that, brought people's attention um, during the war, that they were still one of um, Poroshenko's associates, was it, I can't remember which one, was do, doing deals with Russia and selling the materiel to the Russian, the Ukrainian army at inflated prices. So yeah, and this is what I tried to say when I went back to my, my schematic, which was not only am I just looking at the national level, but each of these spheres, the political practices, the economic practice, they each have many, many strands and dimensions to them for, that would give a full picture. So yeah, the, the, the judiciary is traditionally, especially the procuracy is the, or the, what's he called, the prosecutor general, is traditionally by the way the, the, the elite protect themselves from the rule of law. It's probably a bit too much of a moving target for your for your research, but do you have a take on opinion on the on the latest constitutional court efforts to undermine the reform process? Well, I think that ties in what we've what we've said before. Um, they represent they they bought people like the bought people that I listed the seventy four MPs, who are not necessarily bought in the same way. Some of them are paid for to put on lists by by oligarchs. Some are uh, paid per per vote. That's what Kolomoisky tends to do more. He pays people off for one vote. Some people are actual business people, but they need to, to gravitate to a, a one sphere or another to protect what they've got. So, um, yeah, the Constitutional Court is probably the best example of, the, of, of uh, Zelensky losing, I would say. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. All very, very interesting. Now, last chance to ask any further questions. Okay, so in that case, thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you very much, Dave, for a great and very insightful thank you, Jakob. presentation. Um, and yeah, apologies for some uh, sound issues here and there, it's just the uh, unpredictabilities of, of Wi-Fi performance. Um, yeah, uh, I hope you'll join us again for the next PhD research seminar. We're not yet entirely sure which when the next one will take place, but we'll keep you up to date via UCLC's um, website, Facebook page, and uh, Twitter account. So once again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, have a have a great day, and see you again soon, hopefully.